Thank you and welcome to the ARCO Forum. The Institute of Politics is very pleased tonight to be able to present uh, Senator Bill Bradley, who's going to uh, tonight unveil a major new proposal on campaign finance reform. Uh, as many of you know, he was first elected to the Senate in 1979, and he is, uh, has announced that he will not seek a, a fourth term to that body. Uh, his tenure in the Senate has been marked by uh, involvement in most of the major issues of the day, ranging from tax reform and energy policy to health uh, and education. And he has, it has been remarked about him on many, many occasions that he is one of the most thoughtful members of the U.S. Senate. That is a compliment. And, uh, and that he is um, one of the most effective and indeed is one of those examples that one can be civil and be effective in American politics. Uh, he has been a, an important voice uh, in, the, in our country generating dialogue between uh, our races and among our various ethnic groups. He graduated, uh, some of us at Harvard regret to say, from Princeton with honors. Uh, he was a, a Rhodes Scholar and a professional basketball player for 10 years. Uh, very often uh, uh, over the last several uh, rounds of presidential elections, uh, he has been mentioned uh, prominently as someone who ought to be uh, President of the United States. Uh, he's speaking to us tonight. Uh, <laughs> he is, uh, his topic tonight is freeing democracy uh, from the power of money. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Bill Bradley. Thank you very much, uh, Phil. You ought to be home by about 10 o'clock. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight and to have a chance to speak to all of you. And uh, <clears throat> I had, used to be in basketball, they used to say I had pretty good peripheral vision, which means that I could see to my right and to my left pretty well. But I guess uh, periscopic vision is important here. So um, I'll say to all of you, I'm pleased to be here too. I'm going to try to be as clear as I possibly can tonight in my remarks. So that's not always easy for a politician. Sometimes politicians uh, deal in ambiguity as an art. Um, and uh, yet I think there are times to be clear. In my own career, I have not always been clear. Um, I, like many politicians, have fallen victim to ambiguity, but for uh, probably unforeseen reasons, and I'd like to share with you one story to illustrate that fact. In 1992, I was um, leading a small delegation to Russia. The delegation consisted of Senator Bob Kerry of uh, Nebraska and Congressman Jim Leach of uh, Iowa. And uh, I was the delegation leader. And uh, we were meeting uh, in the St. Petersburg Oblast, which is the county outside St. Petersburg, with a man who, um, on my information sheet, was noted to be um, a private farmer at a time when there were very few private farmers in, uh, in Russia. And he was noted to be the largest chicken farmer in all of Russia. So I'm the delegation leader. My job is to establish rapport with this individual. <laughs> my job is to draw a connection so when we get down to the substantive debate, I might actually, you know, we might get some information that would be interesting. And so I am um, trying to think, what am I going to do in this situation? And so I begin by saying, Mr. Petrov, da. Mr. Petrov says, I'm very pleased to be here. Mr. Ya, Mr. Petrov said. I said, I am. Um, um, Appreciate you taking the time. Da, Mr. Petrov. So finally, I, I reached back and I said, well, Mr. Petrov, I see here you, you're the largest private chicken farmer in all of Russia. Da, Mr. Petrov. So I said, well, in America, we have a saying. And that saying is, those who raise chickens raise hell. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at Carrie from Nebraska, and Leach from Iowa. And they kind of looked at each other as if to say, we do? <laughs> but Mr. Petrov became absolutely sullen, absolutely sullen. Five minutes, five seconds passed, 15 seconds, 
20 seconds, 30 seconds. Finally, you know, the conversation was begun. We had a pretty good conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we left. And when we were leaving, I asked our interpreter, um, listen, you know, what happened in there when I told my joke about the chicken farmer and Mr. Petrov turned so sour? And the interpreter said, well, Mr. Petrov's interpreter had to story a little, he didn't quite translate it the way you said. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, his translator translated that those who raise chickens go to hell. <laughs> so uh, I'll try to be as clear as I possibly can. <laughs> At least we're speaking the same language uh, here. I think, Joe, aren't we speaking the same language? And uh, I want to uh, share with you a few thoughts. Um, about six weeks ago, a man approached me in New Jersey, um, came up to me and he said, Senator, I've worked in this place for the last 22 years, but this place has been owned by three separate companies, and none of the three companies did I vest for pension purposes. So I'm reaching retirement age, but I have no pension. Last summer, as I walked the Jersey Shore, as I do every summer to meet my constituents, it's four or five day walk, about 120 miles, every, every township, it's a great experience for me. I ran into a woman close to the Barnegat Lighthouse, and she said, Senator, my husband lost his job six months ago. I lost my job two months ago. We have three kids, but now we don't have any health insurance. And I went to our pediatrician. He said in case we get into trouble, we'd be, he'd be willing to take care of our kids. But Senator, in the United States of America, you shouldn't have to have a friendly pediatrician in order to get health coverage for your kids. In California, a white collar worker named uh, Ron Smith, who lost his job at McDonnell Douglas about two years ago, told a, told a journalist how his sense was that he was starting to lose his grip and how that feeds into the divisiveness that he felt was pulling the country apart. And he said, I get angry a lot, and the anger is coming out. And I'm blaming everyone, minorities, aliens who come across the border, I mean, I don't know how much truth there is to it. I mean, I don't think there are any planners or engineers coming across the border. But it hurts when you go into an interview and you know damn well that you can do the job. You know they're looking at you and thinking about you getting the job and saying, forget it. In the last seven years, 100,000 people have lost their jobs at GE, 60,000 at IBM, 40,000 at Sears. The merger of Chase Manhattan Chemical will mean 12,000 people have lost their jobs, and AT&T has just announced that it will eliminate 40,000 more jobs, and most of them this year. Senator Joe Biden recently told me a story of the Hercules Research Center outside Wilmington, Delaware. It kind of conveys that sometimes the brutal winds of downsizing blow fairly hard at the Hercules Research Center outside Wilmington, Delaware, the way an employee who arrives on Monday morning knows that he or she has lost his or her job is if a Pinkerton is standing outside their office when they arrive that day for work. And the Pinkerton says to them, well, Alice, we know you've worked here for 20 years and you've done a good job and we appreciate it, but you know, competitive pressures, we've got to downsize. And so, could you possibly have your desk cleared out by noon today, Alice? And by the way, I'll just stand here while you're doing it because I don't want to take any chances with the computer, no offense. And on Mondays at the Hercules Research Center, nobody carpools because it's impossible to predict whether on that Monday you'll have to be out by noon. The heavy footsteps of downsizing, relocation, part-time jobs, temp jobs, middle age without health care, retirement without pensions, 
may be near or still distant, but they are heard in every home in this country. People are working harder for less. In 1973, the average production non-supervisory wage was $315. In 1994, it had dropped to $256, and that covers about 70% of all workers. During the first six months of the Clinton administration in 1993, the administration announced that it had created 1.3 million new jobs, which occasioned a TWA machinist to remark when he heard the news, yeah, and my wife and I have four of them. And indeed, of the 1.3 million jobs that were created, nearly 700,000 were part-time jobs. For all but the fabulously wealthy, the idea that working hard can lead to a secure future, a chance to provide better life for your children and an adequate retirement, all that seems to be slipping away. I hear it. I hear this fear everywhere. Among urban working poor, in suburban living rooms, at factory gates, and among engineers with PhDs and 30 years of experience with large, still profitable corporations. The most painful part of it for me, as someone who entered politics with the belief that government could make people's lives better and more secure, is that the political process seems deaf, almost willfully deaf, to the economic anxieties of non-wealthy Americans. Instead of using public power to balance the excesses of private power and enhance opportunity, too many politicians continue playing the proverbial fibble, fiddle while the lives of working people become more and more desperate. Democrats and Republicans, well, both march along the well-worn paths of symbolic politics waving the flags, welfare, crime, taxes, to divide Americans and win elections. Republicans cling to the illusion that government is the problem, even the enemy of freedom, and that the less government and the freer the markets will automatically relieve the fears of working Americans, and that that working American who lost his $45,000 a year job and has now just taken a $30,000 a year job will be more than happy if he could just get that $300 tax cut. Democrats cling to the old programs, like worker retraining, without ever stopping to ask whether these programs are actually working to change lives for the better, or whether they're jobs available for the workers once they're retrained. In short, the political process is paralyzed, democracy's at a standstill, and the budget stalemate is only the latest headline. The federal government has not been able to act decisively and with public consensus behind it for years on health care, on taxes, on creating jobs, on reforming welfare. We've been at continual deadlock. Democracy is paralyzed not just because politicians are needlessly partisan, as many are. The process is broken at a deeper level, and it won't be fixed by replacing one set of elected officials with another as any more than it was fixed in 1992 or 1994. Citizens believe that politicians are controlled, controlled by special interests who give money, by parties who crush their independence, by ambitions for higher office that make them hedge their positions rather than call it like they see it, and by pollsters who convince them that, the only fo that only the focus group phrase can guarantee victory. Citizens affected by the choices we have to make about spending and regulation simply don't trust that the choice was made fairly or independently or in some cases even democratically. They doubt that the facts will determine the result, much less that honest convictions of politicians will determine the result. Voters distrust government so deeply and so consistently that they're not willing to accept the results of virtually any decision made by the political process. 
For example, I tell the people of my state, New Jersey, as I did in 1989 and 90, that the Tax Reform Act of 1986 reduced their individual taxes a total of $1 billion each of the succeeding two or three years, which is the truth, and they don't believe you at all because their state and local taxes increased enough to offset that tax reduction. It's gotten to the point that I've had constituents call on the phone to ask how I voted on a particular bill. When my office tells them that the vote hasn't occurred yet, they don't believe it. Because the radio talk show host, who hadn't done his homework, says otherwise. For the last six years, since the repeal of catastrophic health care in 1989, through the erosion of environmental laws, to the failure of health care reform, to the backlash against crime bill last year and budget this year, every major step government has taken has been jeopardized by this mistrust, by a deep and widespread conviction that politicians are acting in their own individual interests rather than acting as honest representatives of a democratic will. These are, uh, you know, facts as I see them. There are several reasons for this several reasons, but clearly one of them is money. And those who think it's just perception that politics is driven by money should consider the following facts. In House Senate negotiations over reform of the telecommunication laws, one large telephone company, Ameritech, wins a special provision allowing it to build a monopoly in burglar and firearm business while its competitors are prohibited from entering the industry. Ameritac has a PAC, and that PAC gave almost half a million dollars last year to 600 separate contributions to hundreds of members of Congress of both parties, but primarily to those on the committee making that decision. Another company, Golden Rule Insurance, Inc., gives over $900,000 in PAC money and soft money contribution to members of Congress and hundreds of thousands more to organizations affiliated with the speaker. In return, the company wins endorsement of medical savings accounts, an insurance product offered only by Golden Rule, which would cost the Treasury $4 billion and makes it the centerpiece of the Republican Medicare reform. Lobbyists for big corporate contributors actually sit in the office of congressional leaders and write the legislation to repeal a century's worth of environmental laws. New members of the congressional majority, while billing themselves as reformers, collect on average, on average, more than $60,000 from Washington-based political action committees in just the first six months in office. And half, that's about a year and a half before their next election. And some take more than $100,000 in the first few days. Fact four, state legislators, where most politicians get their start, and which others treat as modest part-time contribution to citizenship, have been taken over by the same forces of money that captured Congress or attempt to capture Congress. State legislative races now routinely cost what congressional races used to cost. In New Jersey last year, state Senate candidates spent a record $8 million on 80 races, most of which were not competitive contests. In Illinois, Assembly and state Senate candidates raised $49 million, 2.4 million of it from out-of-state interests such as gambling companies that seek licenses and new markets. Now, in case there's a little unease in the audience, I've cited more invo examples involving the new Republican majority than Democrats, not because they are uniquely uh, approaching corruption, but because these incidents are more recent and money apparently flows to the winners when the power shifts. While these abuses are not new, the amounts involved and the level of the conflicts seem to multiply every few years. 
with this year's congressional freshmen taking twice as much money from PACs right away than the freshmen who came to office in 1993. I saw one estimate that said in total all levels of government in 1996 in political campaigns would spend nearly a billion dollars. So the story becomes clear. Economic anxiety eats away at people who work in America. Government fails or refuses to respond. Voters develop a profound and unyielding mistrust of the legislative process. Legislators, including some of those posing as reformers, surrender their offices and their consciences to corporate lobbyists and big contributors with narrow interests to protect. Or if they maintain their integrity, as many do, and I'd like to underline that, as many do, they still have to swim in dirty water, which makes it more difficult for them to stay clean. And amid biennial promises of change, nothing ever changes. Well, it's a story Americans have heard before. It's a story of the late 19th century, the era of the spoil system, recurrent scandal, when politics became hostage to the money power of Wall Street financiers, railroads, industrialists, utilities, when each senator was virtually the property of whatever magnet had engineered his appointment by the state legislature. It was a time when Washington was dominated by endless debates about the tariff, a dispute between wealthy financiers and wealthy manufacturers, quite willfully ignoring the economic plight of the vast majority of Americans who were farmers, miners, and factory workers, or women and African Americans prohibited from voting. The theologian Walter Rauschenberg wrote of that time, and I quote, in political life one can constantly see the cause of human life pleading long and vainly for redress, like the widow before the unjust judge. Then suddenly comes the voice of property, and all men stand with their hat in hand. Our nation's history demonstrates that the conduct of democracy is not an abstraction. When politics becomes hostage to money, as it did in the late 19th century, and, it is, and as it increasingly is today, people suffer. Neither economic opportunity nor economic security is given the place it deserves in our national ambitions. There is still a very tangible relationship between the level of opportunity and security available to every American family and the extent to which we can keep our democracy secure and separate from the forces of money. The late 19th century was the last time until now that America's prosperity failed to translate into higher wages and increased security for American workers. Teddy Roosevelt called the money men of politics after participating in the famous 1896 election and being slightly offended by Mark Hanna's excesses, called them the gloomy anticipations of our gold-ridden, capitalist bestridden user master's future. <laughs> How's that for a future president of the United States? But the path to a better 20th century, one that got beyond that, rested on four progressive principles. Universal suffrage. Everybody should have a right to vote in America. Direct election of senators, no more deals in the back room and state legislators. Initiative and referendum to give people a direct check on policy. And finally, campaign finance reform. Although Theodore Roosevelt proposed that, quote, Congress provide an appropriation for the proper and legitimate expenses of each of the great national parties and no party receiving campaign funds should accept more than a fixed amount from any individual unquote, Frank, that was Theodore Roosevelt, only modest disclosure, only modest disclosure requirements were adopted at the time. Well, until we had radically reformed our democracy to take away from the Goulds and the Vanderbilts and the others and give it back to the people, we could not become the kind of nation that protected the elderly from poverty, protected children from abuse, and respected the heritage of our land. But over time, the failure to complete action on the last reform of the progressive era, 
the role of money in politics became a glaring omission. As television replaced the Grange Hall, the saloon, the town square as the central forum for public debate, money became an ever more important factor in who ran for office and who was elected. Today we see people spend $28 million of their own money to run for the Senate. We see a president raising $44 million for a primary campaign that doesn't exist. We see individuals contributing hundreds of thousands of dollars to campaigns by funneling them into several state parties across the country. Many accomplished and capable people are right now tonight, as we are meeting, considering whether to become candidates for the House and the Senate. They should be asking themselves, well, can I work hard enough to do a good job? Or do I have any new ideas that would benefit my constituents? Do I have any idea how to deal with this economic transformation we're in the midst in? Do I really want to put front forward the racial dilemma of America and how to deal with it? Do, do I really understand the nature of civil society and how government interacts with that? Instead, they're wondering, can I find 1,000 individuals and in PACs willing to give me almost a million dollars so I can have a chance in this race? And is there any interest group willing to spend a lot of money to defeat my opponent? Money not only determines who's elected, frankly, it determines who runs for office. Ultimately, it determines what government accomplishes or fails to accomplish. Under the current system, Congress, except in unusual circumstances, will inevitably listen to the 900,000 Americans who give $200 or more to their campaigns than to the 259 million Americans who don't. Real reform of democracy, reform as radical as those of the progressive era and deep enough to get government moving again, must begin by completely breaking the connection between money and politics. It must eliminate interested money. That is, money with strings attached from all congressional and Senate races. We have to start understanding what has happened to the past efforts to free politics from the grip of money, if we're going to begin. Well, there are three profound misconceptions that have led to the demise of every recent proposal to reform campaign finances. The first misconception is constitutional. Supreme Court in 1976, in the case Buckley v. Vallejo, held that a rich man's wallet is no different from a poor man's soapbox. Restrictions on total campaign spending and on wealthy individuals using their own money to buy an office were held to be the equivalent of restrictions on free speech. Even reformers who found this logic absurd have felt it necessary to tiptoe around the Supreme Court, building elaborate contraptions of incentives and voluntary spending limits rather than risking the court's wrath by simply declaring it illegal to buy a seat in the House or the Senate with your own money or someone else's. On something as crucial to democracy as the role of money in elections, a role that has destructively expanded every year I've been in the Senate, the Constitution is the place to fix the thwarting of the people's will. The second misconception is similar but runs deeper. It is rooted in a failure to understand democracy and capitalism are separate parts of the American dream. And that keeping that dream alive depends on keeping one from corrupting the other. Speaker Gingrich, for example, has accused those who advocate spending limits in elections as, quote, nonsensical socialist analysis based on hatred of the free enterprise system, unquote. <laughs> He's compared the $600 million spent on congressional elections with the $300 million spent to advertise three new antacids and concluded that politics is underfunded. Gingrich is not 
the only person who holds this view, but he does make the sharpest accusations, predictably. And I would respond by saying that I have no hatred for the free enterprise system, but it's not the same thing as democracy. Market share is not political power. Democracy and civil society have different ethics from the mar marketplace. The ethos of democracy requires calm, thoughtful deliberation and a willingness to accept losing in a fair process. The ethos of civil society proceeds from a belief that giving without expectation of return is the highest human gift. Both of these ethics are much different from the ethic of the marketplace, the frantic quest for market share and profits, the message that says get as much as you can as quick as you can. The third misconception is that different sources of money in politics are more or less corrupting than others. When politicians write what they call campaign finance laws, they try to protect their own source of funding while cutting off those sources that primarily go to their opponents, predictably. Thus, the endless hair splitting between political action committees, individual contributions, personal wealth of candidates, soft money, and independent expenditures. Some proposals even draw distinctions among various types of political action committees, banning some and protecting others. The result has been legislative proposals that tiptoe around actually limiting spending on campaigns that claim to reduce corruption but don't challenge the idea that money should decide elections and that draw endless distinctions among different types of money. If any of these proposals become law, I think they'd make little difference. But the biggest problem with these tortured, hair-splitting, incremental approaches is that voters can't understand them. They don't, just, they don't see, just as I don't see, how these bills would actually fix what's wrong with democracy. As a result, there are no consequences for politicians to block these proposals. If nobody understands them, if nobody can explain them, but if you block it, who cares? so that even incremental reforms never pass, even when they appear to have the momentum to pass, as we hear every election. Well, to free democracy from the power of money, I believe that we have to start with two straightforward principles. First, money is not speech. A rich man's wallet does not merit the same protection as a poor man's soapbox. Second, all interested money in politics is potentially corrupting. Whether it comes from an individual, a PAC, a candidate's own investments, it sometimes comes with strings attached and limiting one source will only open up others. Money in politics is a little bit like ants in your kitchen. You gotta close all the holes so none of them get in or some of them are gonna find a way in. Today, let me present a specific legislative proposal that I think builds a realistic structure for a new era of American democracy, modestly stated, <laughs> around <laughs> these basic principles that I've tried to describe. I would start by amending the Constitution, simply to clarify that political money is not speech. Now, if the Supreme Court reversed themselves, that'd be fine too. But I'll put forward an amendment that would give every state in the U.S. Congress explicit authority to limit spending in campaigns and contributions from any source. Such an amendment, or as I said, a reconsideration by the court in the Buckley decision, would be essential, would be an essential underpinning of any real reform. I've supported very few constitutional amendments. I can't think of any during my, well, ERA, during my time in public life. And I've been especially skeptical of those that sought to limit rights. However, I am convinced that this amendment would protect rights by strengthening democracy. It would not limit the First Amendment, 
but would clarify that the right to buy an election is not a form of freedom of expression. We should also consider the possibility that our current system of campaign finance is deeply unconstitutional as any reform might be. When years ago, for example, the court outlawed so-called white primaries to which white voters who controlled Democratic parties in southern states met to decide who their candidate would be. Today we have wealth primaries where wealthy contributors determine who has the opportunity to run for office and who has a chance to vote for them. The amendment would eliminate the wealth primary and give every American an opportunity not only to run for office but to vote for who they want to. With the constitutional misconception out of the way, I'd junk it and start from scratch. The proposal would focus on Senate elections, but would provide a model for elections to the House, state legislators, governorships, even, even the handling of referenda. I would give citizens of each state direct control over how much money would be spent in their state's elections. I would say to each taxpayer, in each state, you have an opportunity to give from $1 to $5,000 per year, but only to a campaign in your state. You would contribute it by adding it to your tax liability and sending the checks in with your tax return. But you would be contributing to the election campaign, not to a candidate. All the money would go to a shared fund, and every Senate election on Labor Day, or right after the primary, whichever is uh, later, the candidates would take the fund, divide it equally among qualified candidates, Republican, Democrat, or qualified independent. That's all the money. That's all the money. Outside of the money from the Comet Fund, Senate candidates would not raise or spend any money from PACs, individual donors, the party, their own pockets to further their candidacy. If the voters and taxpayers concluded that they liked the level of information and advertising they got from a $20 million campaign, and if they agreed with Speaker Gingrich, they could choose that kind of election. If they wanted a cheaper election, they could choose that option by their votes on their tax return. To ensure that all candidates have an opportunity, an equal opportunity, to reach all voters, I would reclaim part of the public airways for a public forum. Every broadcast license, radio and television, would be required as a condition of licensing to provide two hours of free time to every candidate, one hour in prime time in units of less than one minute, of at least one minute. In other words, the airwaves are public property. They now offer the closest thing we have to a shared culture and a common forum for discussion of ideas. That forum should not be available only to the highest bidder in questions of democracy. We have not only a right to insist that broadcasters provide that space, but a responsibility to ensure that the public's airspace is used in the interest of rebuilding democracy. Who would be a qualified candidate? eligible to receive money from the common fund and broadcast time. Well, any party that had received 10% of the vote in the previous two Senate elections would automatically qualify once it selected a candidate. Independent candidates or new parties would be required to obtain 5% of all eligible voters in the state, but once they qualified, the candidates and their ideas would be treated equally. A candidate who refused to participate in at least one debate would be completely shut out. He could not participate in the shared fund or raise money separately. Candidates seeking the nomination of a major party, the nomination of a major party, would not receive funds from this shared fund or broadcast time for the primary, but would be permitted to raise private funds in the primary but they'd be required to raise 100% of those funds from contributions of $100 or less. That's it. That's the proposal.
For the general election, there'd be no PACs, no private contributions from wealthy individuals, no bundling of contributions from the executives of companies to evade the PAC funds and limits, no money from out of state, no candidates using their own funds, no refusals to debate. debate. All the sources of potential corruption in the current system would be cut off, speech would be protected, money would be restricted. This proposal, I don't think, will sound like anything you've heard before. And it's going to take a while for people to get used to some of the ideas. Some people will worry that there won't be enough money for a good campaign. After all, you know, California, you've got to spend 20 or $30 million. But if that's so, and the people are less informed, well, that'll be their choice. No longer will it be controlled by the special interests. But keep in mind that TV and radio accounts for some 50% of the costs of campaign. So with free broadcast time, the money which will be cut if voters choose a low-budget campaign would be the money the candidates spend probably on polling, consultants, gifts, and the rest. The process of providing information to voters would more than likely be protected. But then again, if it decreases, the system will adjust and it will have been the citizen's choice. Other people who look at this idea will be offended by the idea of contributing to democracy rather than to a candidate. Some people have asked me, why should I contribute to Jesse Helms? Other people have asked me, why should I contribute to Ted Kennedy? Well, that's a fair concern. But as things now stand, for example, Senator Helms as an incumbent, and for other reasons, raised $17 million, $10 million more than his last opponent. So whether you oppose Senator Helms or support him, putting him and his opponent on a level playing field is far more important than the $1,000 any of us as an individual can give either candidate in that race. If you have the strength of your convictions, there's no reason to fear a fair fight. Others say the proposal helps incumbents, but incumbents have an even bigger financial advantage in the present system, and they are defeated regularly. Besides, if doing your job helps you get reelected, well, who can criticize you for doing your job? Finally, still others may note that I, have, that I personally have supported public financing of campaigns in the past, and this isn't exactly public financing. Indeed, it's not public financing. It does not take taxpayer dollars and provide them to political campaigns. It is not public financing, but it is public control of elections. As long as voters mistrust politicians, as they do, we're not going to get past the skepticism about public financing. We have to rebuild that trust first, and I think giving voters control of campaigns is the way to do it. Well, I believe there's a deep hunger for this kind of reform. I've been very impressed by the energy of a lot of activists in states across this country using one breakthrough in democracy, initiative and referendum, to break down the barriers to another innovation, campaign finance reform. Never before have we seen so much grassroots activity on the issue of campaign finance reform. In 1994, ballot initiatives were won for campaign finance reform in Missouri, Oregon, and Montana, as well as the District of Columbia in 1992. And so far, we can expect in 1996 initiatives on the ballot in Maine, California, Alaska, Arkansas, and Colorado. Other states where groups are considering initiative drives include Wisconsin, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Illinois. The initiatives on the ballot this year are radical and serious. Whether they emphasize modest public financing or limiting contributions to $100, they are big, uncompromised reforms that would go a long way toward freeing state legislators from the grip of moneyed interests. Consider those state activists as partners in this reform proposal, because I believe they deserve to have a proposal on the table in Washington that is as radical, as serious, and as real as what people are talking about in the states. 
Many politicians and academics may focus on what they see as the worst possible outcome of this proposal, and I can see some of the minds turning now, that voters, given control, might choose simply to sharply cut back the amount of money available in campaigns. After all, the presidential checkoff is declining. Indeed, they seem to be contributing, as I say, less to the presidential. But if that happens, the worst consequence would be a resurgence of what? Door-to-door -door campaigning, politicians listening instead of polling, campaigns led by candidates and their ideas rather than consultants and their focus group tested attack ads. In other words, the system would adjust in what could very well be a way that reinvigorates citizen participation. To argue against changing the status quo that everyone knows compromises democracy is a terribly pessimistic position. Now is the time, I think, to be bold, not timid. At best, however, I believe that <clears throat> giving voters control over campaigns will be enough to turn democracy to the people, freeing it from the power of money. It could restore confidence and faith in the legitimacy of democratic decision making, freeing both Congress and the presidency from a cycle of gridlock, action, backlash. Ultimately, I think it will free our democracy to do what it can do when it works well, to free it to do what it can do when it works well. And that is use the power of government to build a structure of economic security and economic opportunity for all Americans. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have, we have two microphones, if you'll very briefly identify yourself for uh, our speaker in the audience, and uh, please, if you'll try to keep your questions short, then we can maximize the number of participants. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, I know this is the Kennedy School, but let me tell you, I like to do questions and answers. I guess I'll pick one or the other. You ask your question. If I don't know the answer to the question or I think it's stupid, I'll go like this. You move away and I'll call <laughs> on you. Now, some places that would intimidate people, but uh, I don't think that'll be the case here. So, I'll go to my right first. Yes. Uh, just a, I'm in uh, basketball, not politics. I... Um, I, I'd just like to make a very sort of quick statement of fact and then a, uh, and then a, a quick question. Um, first of all, in uh, something that I think is interesting, talking about the, the campaign finance, you identified um, money with basically buying democracy. The candidate in, 1990, in the 1992 Republican primary that spent the most money in New Hampshire was not George Bush or Pat Buchanan, but a businessman named Jim Lenane who won less than 2% of the vote. Um, and then a quick question. I'd, I'd like to pose a situation and see how your plan deals with this. Um, Ross Perot says he wants to run for president, and he wants to put an ad in a newspaper. Um, they want to charge him $10,000 to put an ad in the New York Times or something like that, saying, vote for me. Um, according, to your, according to your proposal, that if he's a candidate, that would be against the law. Um, but you don't see any sort of, I mean, I know you said you want to amend the Constitution for this. You don't see any sort of problem that somebody can actually say, raise the speech object, the, the speech point, yeah. I'd like to be president of the United States? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I see your point, and I obviously thought about it before I made the decision that I was still going to amend the Constitution on this issue. I guess, I'm a, I guess I'm a child of the Declaration of Independence more than I am a child of the narrow interpretation of the Constitution. But um, I think that this, uh, and I don't put you in this category, but you've raised the issue, so let me take it from where you put it. Um, for us to think 
And we see this exemplified at the moment in the Forbes candidacy. It was in the Perot candidacy last time. For us to think that somebody spending millions of his own money to promote himself is a threat is is a in, not a threat to the ability of all of us to have our voice heard shows us the extent to which self-interest has moved to center stage in American life in my opinion and what happened to working with your friends and neighbors who join you because they kind of respect you, think you're a good guy? Actually, they've, they've, they've tested you in some tough circumstances. They saw, they saw what you did whenever there was a racial interest at school. They saw what happened in the community when the factory closed. They know your career as a businessman, and they respect you because they've seen you tested over time. What's wrong with having those people come together to support somebody as opposed to having somebody write out a big check and say, Gee, I'd like to be president of the United States. <laughs> I mean, you know, one day it's a villa in France, next day it's president of the United States. So I think that, I think that we can be reasonable here and not impinge on people's, you know, what happens is there are a couple of proposals that build all kinds of contraptions around this that essentially amount to taking away a rich man's uh, wallet. But they become so complicated and so unwieldy that when you start to explain it to people, they simply say, well, no, we've got to amend the Constitution. That's clear. People understand that. You say, well, we're going to have this incentive, that incentive, da, 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 da. Most of the people go, you know, like some of you did up there during the course of the uh, But so that would be my answer to the question. Yes. Hey, good evening, Senator. Um, I, my name is Eric Christofferson, and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, I first want to say that I enjoyed your comments this evening, but um, as a young person and a Democrat mm -hmm. here on uh, Harvard campus, I'm often envious of the uh, energy of the Republican Party on which uh, my Republican classmates can feed off of. And I was wondering, um, what is it about the Democratic Party that you feel you can't add to in the way that, say, Newt Gingrich has to the Republican Party? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure what your question is. Um, I am a Democrat, so if you wonder about that, let me clarify that. Um, if you're really asking, you know, why are you leaving? More or less. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I think, that, I think being a United States Senator is the best elective job in the world. I've had um, a wonderful uh, 17 years in the U.S. Senate, full of memories, accomplishments, some heartbreaks. Um, and when I leave at the end of the 18th year, I'm going to leave a, leave a part of myself in the institution, just as I left a part of myself on the floor of the garden in New York, Madison Square Garden, maybe in the Boston Garden, too. <laughs> and uh, probably more in the Boston Garden. <laughs> Uh, but for me, at this time, uh, there are things I want to do that I think are better done from the outside. For example, given the hectic schedule uh, of the Senate, the way the life is, I don't think it gives you enough time to do what I think has to be done, which is to formulate and essentially rethink a new narrative for America to understand the information age and the anxieties that it's generating in people, as well as the yearning on the part of millions of Americans for something deeper than the material. You can't do that. You can't do that in the midst of, you know, budget battles, crises, annual appropriations, uh, budget. And second, I believe that you will not get fundamental as fundamental as I've described today, campaign finance reform on the inside. You have to build the movement from the outside. People say it's never been done before. Well, I think that it could be done in the right circumstance. So I want to move to the outside. So people say to me, well, um, what, what do you, why do you want to move to the outside? What does that mean? What are you, what are you going to do? Or, what? And I say, well, there are two models out there that kind of in thinking things through, I've, I've kind of looked to. 
One is what I call the Jean Monnet model, which is, you know, Jean Monnet into World War II. He's got an idea, gee, you know, Europe or the future would be better if it was one place as opposed to 12 places. So he writes about it. He talks about it. He argues it. He talks to left and right. He talks to business and labor. He talks to everybody to get this idea of a new narrative for Europe accepted in the broadest possible way. I don't compare myself to Jean Monnet, nor do I compare myself to the next individual I'm going to talk about, who is John Gardner, who in the midst of the last campaign finance crisis, i.e. Watergate, said, well, you know, we need to have a grassroots organization called Common Cause to begin to restore people's trust that we can get hold of our democracy. I think our current circumstance requires both of those things, both the new narrative and the grassroots organization that informs it with real political power. So, you know, that's what I'll be doing with some of my time. Um, thanks for coming tonight. This is a great proposal. I, I think it's a wonderful idea to, to have put forth. Um, I'm Andrew Shallot, not a student here recently, but sort of voluntarily laid off computer scientist. Um, I was going to ask you know, it's a great proposal. I was going to ask how you get it done, and you've sort of given a brief outline of that. Well, thank you very much for your question. Expand on that a little bit more. <laughs> the, the next question is if you think um, if you think this is something that has to be done grassroots, or um, if Bill Gates, for example, offered you a billion dollars to fund a campaign to make this happen, <laughs> would you accept it? <laughs> I probably would, yeah. <laughs> you mean that he would fund the whole effort? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or Ross Perot, for I example. I mean, you know, there are well-meaning individuals. I'm, I'm not caught in logical inconsistencies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that you raise a good question, because the question you raise is, look, if you're in an unequal battle, and somebody comes and says, look, I'll give you an equal weapon. Do you take it and use it? The answer is yes, you would take it and use it in order to achieve the larger purpose. I mean, you know, there's purity and there's purity. Right? <laughs> he, by the way, he hasn't done that, but if, <laughs> if you know him. OK, yes. Thanks. My name is Avery Gardner. I'm a junior at the college, and I'm the chair of the Student Advisory Committee here at the Institute. And I don't mean to belabor the point of how we do get this implemented, but just one more question on the topic, if I may. That is, do we start with the states? Do we start with the ballot initiatives in Maine and Arkansas? Um, or do we focus on the constitutional amendment? They seem to be very different um, yeah. Yeah, they objectives. Are. And I'm not entirely sure how to achieve them both at the same time. Um, and so on which would you focus the interest and the action? Well, since all of you are young people wondering what you're going to do in the next six to eight months and you want to be publicly involved, um, I frankly think you ought to go to work in those states and pass those initiatives because that's the beginning of building the kind of pressure that I'm talking about. Those initiatives are on the ballot today. And this idea is an idea I've just expressed today in, in Cambridge that will be a bill that I'll introduce in the next week or so. And I don't see any uh, conflict between the two, and the immediate organizing opportunity is in those states. So uh, if you want to know the addresses, I'm going to be certainly in those states, because I see that as furthering this objective. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I did see the President and Speaker Gingrich shake hands in New Hampshire and say we're going to get campaign finance reform. So maybe, you know, if they get it done this year, it'll all be over. <laughs> but my suspicion is that they're probably not going to get it done this year. And that means that the proposal I've made probably will be alive for a couple of years. And so the actions in the states help further the proposal I've made. Good evening, Senator. My name is Anish Chopra. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. When you were speaking earlier about um, the influence of money, I was curious about how you would characterize um, your support for Section 936 in the tax code 
given the, the, the groundswell of money you raised from the pharmaceutical industry right. based in Jersey. Now, yeah. I don't see that being a problem since you represent the pharmaceutical industry, but how would you characterize it? Well, I mean, I think that's a reasonable point. I just did an hour-long interview with Frontline, and the question came up. <laughs> uh, basically, I think specifically on the 936, when I introduced the fair tax in 1982, we eliminated 936. In the final passage of uh, the uh, tax reform in 1986, it was included. In 1993, we cut it by about 40 to 50 percent. I personally think it's indefensible in terms of tax policy and should be eliminated from the tax code. The question is when and with what ramifications on Puerto Rico. You don't want to end up uh, turning Puerto Rico into a colony because you don't have because you, you have massive unemployment there. So if you have public policy that counters the loss of that for Puerto Rico, I have no problem with that. Um, in terms of uh, campaign finance connections, uh, look, uh, I raised a lot of money in 18 years. I raised a lot of money in 1990, more than I needed to. I raised uh, pretty good money in 1984 probably about what I needed to. And I concluded that uh, on the specific question, it's a little bit like uh, when I was a senior in high school and 75 colleges offered me basketball scholarships and journalists or interested citizens would come around and say, well, what did they offer you to go to Southern University of Southern California or UCLA? And the answer was, look, if they offer me anything, they'd be kicked out of the house, so they don't offer me anything because they know that. So in terms of people who contributed to my campaign, it's the same thing. If anybody ever asked for anything, they'd be kicked out of the office. So they don't ask for anything because they know that. So uh, you know, that is the best way I can deal with that subject. Good evening, Senator. My name is Beverly Lasovic, and I'm just an average citizen who's lucky enough to still have her job. Haven't lost it yet. I'm in health care. Um, after listening to you tonight, I have to add a personal note that you were one of my heroes and still are now after the speech, even though you never were a Boston Celtic, I have to say. <laughs> um, I was going to ask how you're going to implement your plan, so you can talk more about that. The other question, though, I do have is really um, absent a groundswell of support from you know, the grassroots, how many of your colleagues in the Senate do you think at this point would be willing to support your program? Not many. I mean, uh, there's a nonverbal response to this proposal in the Senate. Um, but there, there's a nonverbal response to a lot of things that are self evident to the American people, but that aren't perceived by people in the midst of a more narrow life. And so um, I think that it will only happen on the outside. It will not happen on the inside. And uh, not that there aren't good people, great people, people who are committed to this, people who would support it, people who are on the brink of supporting it. But you have to, it's a little bit like talking about race. I mean, you know, I mean, I've for years tried to speak out on the issue of race. And people come up to me and say, that's really a good speech. I'm, I'm going to give one next week. And next week never comes. And so I figure, well, if I'm out there on the front lines on that issue, showing that you can speak with candor about the issue of race and not be vaporized by the body politic, well, this is a little bit the same thing. If you can be out there on this issue and try to talk about it and build support for it, maybe people will see that, you know, this is some political win to be for this idea. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Chris Parquet. I'm from the National Voting Rights Institute in Boston. And um, I'd like to publicly thank you for uh, mentioning the wealth primary. You're the first um, congressperson to publicly acknowledge this exclusionary Sorry. process that happens. Um, and our, um, our uh, executive director is the, one of the people who coined the wealth the wealth primary. I put quotes on it. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not calling you on copyright infringement, but I do want to thank you for publicly acknowledging that there is this exclusionary process that many people don't recognize, but I wanted to add um, a little something to your speech that you mentioned, that this takes place in um, the senatorial elections and other things, but also in nearly 40 states. 
um, the people um, vote for judges and money influences, influences those elections very much and we need to be aware of that and work on that. Um, and my question is, um, I'm interested in what leap, what made you make the leap from total public financing to the plan you um, mentioned this evening? Um, what made me make the leap uh, was that I believe that there is such a distrust of government that when you say you're going to raise taxes and government will give money to candidates, that is a bigger hurdle to get over than the proposal that I offered today. Uh, so it was a judgment call uh, on my part as to what was a better way to go. I have supported public finance in the past, but you never get, you never get beyond first base, with, certainly with all Republicans, but with many other people who are, who are sensitive to the concern about distrust of government. We only have time for one more question in order to get you to your Well, question. you should pick it, Phil. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dave Bonfili. I'm a senior here at the college. Um, I guess my question sort of ties on to the question previously asked. You mentioned earlier uh, that there was a chance that the money uh, available for campaigns would decline, that in fact that was, that was likely to happen if you don't have limits, if you don't have public financing. There's not really a, a floor on how low that money could fall. Um, and you sort of briefly raised and then blew off the idea of incumbency advantage um, playing into that if you don't have enough money in the, enough money in the campaign. Um, I think your ideas and your plan is really thoughtful, but I guess I'm somewhat concerned by the idea of how that can factor in. You said people weren't elected uh, in 94. Congress people have been not elected before, but I think it's hard to point to examples where someone wasn't either outspent or victimized by you know, carrying some scandal around with them that damaged their viability um, in terms of being reelected. So do you think that's not a problem? Um, and when you're talking about public funding um, and not, not supporting that, is it simply as I think you sort of got on the previous question, mm -hmm. simply because it's not feasible or because you think it's improper? Um, I would rather do it this way. Uh, that's why I have selected this way to do it. Uh, which is, you know, I don't know if that's a tautology or what, but uh, I, I, I think it's also, I've been, I've been playing the public finance tune for a long time. And it becomes very complicated. You carry the burden of the whole anti-government feeling right now. If you want this to be a tonic for government, then I think this is a much better approach than to try, try to do it through the uh, public financing route. I just think there are too many people that are too skeptical about what government does to want to have their tax dollars go to fund congressional and, and Senate races. And my example of that would be the decline in the checkoff at the presidential level, which maybe says that uh, this would, these would be smaller campaigns in Senate races, which means people wouldn't contribute. But you'd have your free TV time. So you'd have smaller races, it'd move more to citizen participation, and I think in the long run would probably prove a more helpful result for the body politic. Thank you all very much, I appreciate it. <laughs>